And good afternoon. Welcome to Now You See TV. I'm your host, Jake Grant. And today, episode, we are going to be talking about preparing come what may and how to get ready. And we're going to be discussing several things with Zachary Bauer, who's joining us once again um, from a, an American homestead and new to Torah. And we're go going to be discussing things about how you will fare in a economic and societal collapse. Today, we're going to be covering topics like food, water, shelter, energy, security, community, waterability, life preservation, wealth preservation, and debt freedom. Because truly, you are a slave when you are tethered to a system and you depend on a system to sustain your life. So we're going to talk about what happens when that system is pulled out from underneath you. And we're going to be getting into that with Zach. And just real quickly, I wanted to make an announcement. Um, we are pleased to uh, just celebrate uh, Gary Arbel, who promotes Torah Town. It's a cartoon for kids that goes through the tour portions and has several animations. They're celebrating their one year anniversary and he asked me to give them a shout out today on today's episode. So congratulations Gary and Torah Town uh, for your one year, one year anniversary and you guys can check that out over at Torah Town and uh, on Facebook and um, also on YouTube. So congratulations Gary and uh, keep at it. Now, um, back to today's topic. If you guys like this video, please like this video. It helps us out and we can get this out to a lot of other people. And um, without further ado, welcome to Now You See TV, Zach. Glad to have you back. It's always great to be here, Jake. Thanks. All right. So where do we start? We're, we're starting with just people who might not have any idea about this whole prepping phenomenon or the, the mentality of prepping, where does somebody who is just tuning into this video has no idea how to even get ready for something like societal collapse or economic collapse, where are we going to start today? Well, let's ask the question, how are you going to fare in a collapse, societal collapse, economic, economic collapse? I think most people don't think, let's just start off right here. Let's just start off with denial, okay? Because I think that's the biggest issue. To, the biggest hurdle to get over is the denial. Um, most people don't think that a collapse is actually going to happen. But I want to I wanna just point out some things, some fundamentals. But first, let's start off this way. We have lived in a country that has given us and the generations who have come before us you know, so much security and relative comfort that we have forgotten what it is to be susceptible to societal upheavals. Okay. We don't know what that means. It's something foreign to us. So when someone comes to you and says, we need to prepare and you're like, ah, shut up. Oh, we don't need to hear that nonsense. And actually you can actually go back to the Bible in Jeremiah's time. And Jeremiah was, you know, basically preaching preparedness and societal collapse and all the people were making fun of him and telling him that he was a moron for you know believing this way and that don't worry god's going to protect us and it's the same thing you hear to see today in america america is blessed we have god's favor don't you know and so this is never going to happen to us and so the reason that is is number one we have forgotten our history we have forgotten world history and we have lived under this comfort for so long that we have forgotten what it what it takes to manage and effectively deal with um, hardships in our country. Because see, you you gain experience and you you gain strength through experience of dealing with things in your life. You 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 know practice makes perfect, right? You deal with things you know effectively the more you deal with them. Well, because we have not dealt with these issues for so long, we have no idea what they look like anymore. We have no idea how to recognize them and then deal with them effectively as a people. And so, uh, you know, you really go back to the last time our country really had to face anything, any type of hardship was back in the depression. And that was like what, 1929, 1930s. Okay. So it's been a long time. You go back before that, you're looking at the civil war, you know, before the industrial revolution, which made a lot of comforts that we have today possible. And so but back before the civil war, people had no, I mean, it was a really hard time back then that people had to deal with. And then, and then the aftermath of the civil war in this country world in world history terms, we have countries that are falling all the time and having economic up upheavals. Um, you have Venezuela recently, you have Argentina, you have Bosnia, Sarajevo. I mean, these are big metropolitan areas where, you know, people could consider them second, you know, even first world countries 
before their collapses, uh, Caracas, Venezuela was a very metropolitan town. Um, you know, uh, Buenos Aires was a very metropolitan town. Sarajevo was a very metropolitan, you know, metro, you know, isk type of town. And metro, and so these these collapsed, and it was it was very much a hardship for the people who lived there. But they never thought it would happen to them. So to think that it can't happen to us when it has happened to us in the past, and then it's happening all around the world in different places. Right now, South Africa is on the brink, and this is a first world country. I've been there now, and I, I couldn't believe how amazed how, how beautiful of a of a country this is, and it's this close to upheaval. Um, and people being forced to leave their lands who have been there for centuries. The people who settled that area in the 1700s, these farmers have been there longer than America has even been a country. And they're this close to being told to either get out or they're going to fight and die protecting their lands, losing the lives of themselves and their families. So it can happen here. So let's just get past the whole idea that it can't happen here. We're in God's favor and that America is never going to be touched by any of these calamities. Yeah. So I know a lot of people, they don't think anything could happen, especially here in the Western world, in the United States of America, we're sitting on a high horse, nothing bad could happen. Um, what is the first big scenario that you think could happen and what, would that mean people need to be prepared for? Well, let's, let's, that's a great question. And so let's continue down our fundamentals here. Right now, we live in a country, you and I, that's $20 trillion in debt. Okay. Someone once said, the debt that can't be paid won't be. Okay. The reason it won't be paid is because it can't be paid. There's no way this country is ever going to get out of the $20 trillion hole. Okay. So a debt that can't be repaid won't be. So there's coming a default. In this country. And so when you look at countries, people say, oh, we'll never default. We'll never have economic. You don't understand inflation. You don't understand history because you go back throughout history, you see all of the countries that have gone through economic collapses before it. It's usually because the currency failed, the currency had no more buying power. And so the economy collapsed. And then what followed? What are the hardships those people had to deal with? So the reality is we're $20 trillion in debt. So my first you know, way of thinking is that we're look, we're staring at an economic collapse, a, a, a run on the banks, a, 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 a world or a country where the, the buying power of the dollar has been reduced to nothing. In fact, it's already being reduced. We're already experiencing inflation, massive inflation. We, ha we haven't got to run away inflation yet. But let me give you an example, Jake. You go to the store five years ago and you pick out a jar of peanut butter. And let's just say, I don't know what a jar of peanut butter, maybe it's like 10 ounces, okay, at the jar. And you're paying $5 for that jar of peanut butter. Well, now you say, well, the jar of peanut butter is still $5 at the store. Compare that jar to today's jar that you buy at the same store. The jar has been narrowed at the top. The jar has been narrowed at the bottom. It's a smaller cylinder of a jar. And then not only that, but the bottom of the jar has now been concave, whereas the other jar was flat. This jar is concave. So what really what you have is the jar of less peanut butter. So this jar over here holds 10 ounces, and this jar over here holds seven and a half. But you're still paying the $5 for the jar of peanut butter, but you're getting less peanut butter. And so the inflation has been hidden from us because we don't understand how the, the economics are working. We're getting less for your money. Your dollar has less buying power. And that's a result of the, the, the inflation that's happening in this country. It's being such and so far amount of debt that it's never going to be recovered. And, you know, they're, they're, they're pumping the economy full of U.S. currency so that, to hide the inflation. But if you look closely, you can see the inflation at your local supermarket or wherever you shop because it's happening. That, that sort of example is happening everywhere across all product lines. So uh, go ahead. Now, in, in many countries, when we see this type of inflation, whenever it gets way out of hand, you, you have people with wheelbarrows of money going around trying to buy the loaf of bread. And and I know that's probably not very fun to have to carry a backpack full of cash just to get something daily necessity type you know, things. And and uh, and, it, and I, I see what you're saying with the inflation. Um, so please go on. 
Well, yeah, and, and you know, a lot of countries recently have gotten to that point. Uh, Zimbabwe is one of the most famous ones because it just got so out of control. Um, I have, I should have brought it for the video. I didn't even think about it, but it's put away right now. It's a $100 trillion bill from Zimbabwe. Wow. $100 trillion bill, and I have seven of them. So I, I ordered them online because after the economy collapsed in Zimbabwe, uh, they just went back to U.S. currency uh, to use U.S. currency, but they had printed a one hundred trillion dollar. In fact, that wasn't even the highest denomination, I don't believe. So um, they even had higher denominations than that. One hundred trillion dollar bill. So you're basically bringing yeah, a cartload of these to buy a loaf of bread. And at that point, the public usually just gives up because there's no way you can keep up with it. It's just it's it's ridiculous. So, you know, we'll get into some of this other stuff. But again, let's concentrate on fundamentals. So the country's twenty million, twenty trillion dollars in debt. It's not going to be repaid. Um, the debt amongst the people. Now we're just talking about the government. The debt, the debt amongst the people is higher than it's ever been when it comes to student loans, and credit cards, uh, their their mortgages, you know, car payments, whatever. Uh, in general, the, the country, the people of this country have never been in so much debt in, in our history than it is right now today. Okay, so again, a debt that can't be can't be repaid will not be. The lines between, and this is the big one here. So again, fundamentals, the lines between right and wrong have never been more blurred than they are today in this country. This is a nation that effectively has no more morals to it. We don't know what's right and wrong. The people at the universities are educating our students and, and kids. They're telling people that there is no God, that you don't have to listen to God. You don't have to read the Bible. The Bible is just a book of fairy tales anyway. And this is not a Christian, Judeo-Christian nation. So you can do whatever you want in life. Whatever feels good, you do it and have fun doing it. So there's no morals anymore. No difference between right and wrong. How is a nation going to love its neighbor if there's nothing telling them to love their neighbor? You know, and so not only do you have the economic collapse staring you in the face mathematically, but you have a nation that's no longer being taught what is right and wrong. And so when that collapse happens, how is this going to fare for the average person? And it's not going to fare out, well. Coming out recently, you have these statistics of young people who are totally for living in a, a socialist uh, just society. I think it was like. 30%, but the shocking number was that over 50% did not want to live under a capitalist society. So it's just the, the mindset is crazy, especially today when you look at socialist uh, countries like, like Venezuela and the things that happened there, people are not taking the examples of, of what true socialism is, and, and they forget that you know, you have to willingly be be willing to share your stuff and 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 help your neighbor. But in a socialist economy and, and all that, it, it it really it just is a recipe for disaster. Right. And, and our education system has failed to teach people history, to teach people, you know, these examples. Um, the, the education in this country is so far left and so far socialist that there's really no again. Another reason why this is why you need to prepare, because there's a collapse coming. OK, now we can debate back and forth whether they're in the last days and our Messiah is coming back soon and, and, and Jesus or Yeshua is coming back and we're all going to be saved. And we can debate that all day long. But, you know, throughout history, empires have risen. Empires have fallen. Take a look at what happens to the people within those empires. All we hear about mostly are the leaders of those empires. What happens to them? But what about the people? How did they fare? And if you go back to our history, what you're going to learn is they did that usually don't fare so well. Those who are prepared, those who take some precautions, those who you know take some investments, certain investments in themselves and in their future and in, in their property, they are the ones who come out the highest, who, who end up be faring the best during those circumstances. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Now we've got to the fundamentals. See, what you see mostly, Jake, on people uh, on, on the internet and these videos or whatever, they're all just talking about doom and gloom and how it's about to happen and, and it's right around the corner and but they never really tell you about what to do about it. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to try to talk today. Here's what you do. Here's some of the things you can do to ensure your family's safety during this time that is coming. So right off the bat, you tied in the economics and the idea of inflation and the inability to buy just normal things with, with money. And so what are some of the major things that people buy today that make them completely dependent on the grid, that make them dependent on living in that society that operates by that currency? 
Oh, yeah, sure. One second. I'm going to show you this real quick. Jamie heard me. And I was like, I'll bring it in. Here's my, there's my, some of my Zimbabwe seven trillion, seven, well, no, 100, 100 trillion dollar bills. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> yeah. What those, that's real currency, folks. It was at one time in Zimbabwe. And now it's, it's basically toilet paper. So, yeah, what are some of the things, what were you saying? What were some of the things you can buy? Yeah, like today, okay, people depend on going to the grocery store to buy their food. They depend on being able to buy utilities. They depend on being able to buy uh, toiletries. Um, they, they depend on being able to buy their gas with this currency that we're currently on. So, um, you know, what are, what are some of the things that people are desperately dependent on the system for when it comes to buying with this currency? Well, we're, we're dependent on everything. We're dependent on absolutely everything that there is to be dependent on. Most Americans are. So I, I have this meme that I share oftentimes on Facebook every so often. I share it on the American Homestead channel uh, on Facebook. And it's a picture of an old lady standing in the middle of her garden. And it says, Grandma survived the Great Depression because she knew how to do stuff. <laughs> we don't know anything anymore. We don't know how to do stuff. You know, she survived the Great Depression because she knew how to do stuff. And she had uh, she had a network in place amongst her neighbors and amongst family that always allowed her to keep going. We don't have this stuff, folks. Most people who live in subdivisions and their, in their towns have never even met their neighbors, much less talked to them, you know, or, or got, have gotten together with them on a regular basis. I know all my neighbors and I, and I talk to them on a regular basis. In fact, it's not uncommon. You're driving down the road and you pass them. You sit there in the pickup truck with the windows rolled down, talking to them for 20, you know, 10, 20 minutes. They never do that because when you get in your car in your sub, in your suburb, you're, you're off and you're going and your, your windows are up and your AC is going and your radio is going and you don't have any care in the world except about where you're headed to. That's it. Uh, you don't care about anyone around you. And so you don't have a network. Grandma, survived the Great Depression because she knew how to do stuff and she, and her network was local. She knew people. She knew things. And so we're dependent on everything. Um, I, I would suggest, you know, let's just start off top of the list here. Food. What can you do? You know, I, I would urge people because some people think, oh, well, I can just buy all that, that prepackaged food stuff that they sell online and those MREs and, you know, those big packages that cost $1,000 and it gives me a year's supply of food. All I have to do is add water and heat. I would avoid those things. Number one, they go bad over time. They don't last as long as they claim. They are expensive, okay, very expensive. And, you know, you can do so much more by just going down to your local co-op and buying grain and packaging it up and it'll keep a lot longer. You know, I'm sure you've probably heard they have found grain in Egyptian tombs, wheat and planted it and sprouted it. It's like, you know, 3000 years old. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. you know, you know, so I mean, go ahead and just package that stuff, package beans, learn how to grow a garden, you know, just try this spring. It's springtime. Now is your opportunity. Go plant a tomato and, and watch it grow and just see if you can keep it alive all summer. You know, that experience will teach you so much, you know, in terms of what you could do later on about food production. Not, not only that, but it'll open up a lot of scripture to you on, on some things. But just try to grow something, grow a garden, grow some, you know, maybe if, if you're in the suburbs but not really in the city, see if your suburbs will allow you to have a couple of hens, chickens, you know, that you can have eggs from and produce your own food that way. Um, you know, so there's lots of things you can do with food without just thinking you have to go to – Sam's Club and spend a bunch of money or going and buying some of these package deals of food uh, that you're going to maybe keep and never eat. And you open them up one day when there is an emergency and find out they're all rancid and spoiled. Uh, you know, go out and try to just get some raw beans, dried beans, dry wheat, get a grinder, make learn how to make bread. Uh, we've said long, you know, many times throughout the years for a long time that one of the best preps you can do is just learn how to cook. <laughs> just learn how to cook, you know, it's because what do we do today? Most people, all they do is just go out to the restaurants, you know, six times a week, you know, and, and whatever their home, it's a TV dinner out of the fridge or a microwave burrito or, you know, they haven't, they've never cooked anything. 
Well, how are you going to put together some ingredients and eat and stay healthy if a collapse happens? You're not, you're not going to. So food, food is a big thing, food. <laughs> so, so worst case scenario, we have somebody watching right now who lives in the middle of a big city and they have all concrete because growing up, I lived in Manila, a city of 20 million people. We had no dirt for as far as the eye could see. And um, what was the, what would be the best thing to invest in if you were stuck in the middle of a massive city um, in terms of things to stock up on? Uh, I know you mentioned beans and rice, but is there a particular type? If somebody is just, hey, I don't even know what to do. What is the one item or the two items that I need to get? Because I'm living in a city. I can't plant. I can't farm. What do I do? Get out of the city. That simple. Get out. If you think you're going to be in the city and increase your chances of living and surviving, no matter with, with certain preps or certain items you can buy, you're, you're diluting yourself. Get out of the city. Um, th those places are going to be death traps for people who stay in them. And I, I've been telling these people, and people always scoff at me, Zach, I can't leave the city. This is where my job is. Get a new job. Zach, I can't leave my city. This is where my family is. Take them with you. The, Zach, this is, I'm in the city. This is where I have to be for whatever, such and such reason. Change your circumstances. Get out of the city. And people, I can't leave. Yes, you can. You turn your feet out towards the city gates and you just keep on going and you're gone and you, and you build and, and be a go getter and, and, you know, go start a new life somewhere else in a more rural place where you can have a garden and the cost of living is lower. And, you know, I got debt. I got debt. Well, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about debt later. That's part of one of the last things, uh, wealth preservation and debt freedom. We'll talk, we'll talk about that. But um, yeah, get out of the city, man. There's there's nothing you can buy. There's no prep you can have that's going to increase your chances of survival. Uh, could you survive in the city if, during an economic collapse? Absolutely. But if you look at Caracas, you look at Sarajevo, you look at Buenos Aires, and you read about some of, of the events and how people had to survive in those cities, and these are modern times. These are three examples of recent modern times, you know, uh, 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 Buenos Aires was, I believe, 1992-1991 collapse. Um, Sarajevo is 1995-96. Um, Caracas, right now, is what's happening. Okay, Those are three examples right now. You can go back and look at the history and see how those people in those cities fared. And I can tell you many of them did not fare well. Many of them did not, did not survive, and they starved. So um, get out. Get out. So still on that same note, um, okay, we understand we it's not a good thing to be in the big city, but the one item we can pack up on that's best nutrition wise that we can stock up on, store up on, and we could, you know, if you just ate one food item to survive during months and months of societal collapse, what would that item be? Uh, rice. It's what a majority of the world already lives on. Um, it's uh, for the most part got all the all the, the vitamins and minerals that you need to survive. Obviously, it's best if you can add, add things to it. Um, a lot of the white rice that you buy at the store has been enriched with additional minerals. Um, uh, brown rice will not stay very long. If you keep brown rice, even though brown rice is healthier, it includes a lot of uh, essential oils and some other, not essential oils, but um, yeah, that's right. Maybe different oils, and, but those oils go rancid. So you can't keep brown rice for a very long time at all. Uh, white rice will last forever. And um, and some wild some of the wild rice out, rices out there will last a good amount of time too. Um, brown rice will not. So if if you had to have some food that you knew you could store up forever, and maybe just add some spices and some other things to go with it, uh, rice, simple. Right on. And for those of you who don't know how to cook rice, just one scoop of rice, one <laughs> cup of water, boil it until it turns fluffy, and then there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So another major thing that we need to cover is even more important so than food, and that's water. So what do we do in this situation? Yeah. So when we, when we were living in the city, one of the first things we did is we got a number of water filters. Um, and some water filters can be expensive. Uh, the good ones are expensive. So you need to prioritize and go ahead and get a couple water filters. Katadyne is a company that makes a really good water filter. Uh, Berkey is another one that makes a really good water filter. They make all different sizes. Um, but your water is going to be very, very important. So here's the deal. Water comes to you for free. 
And you can find different ways to capture that water. Um, you can even find ditches, and even in the cities, sewers and stuff like that, where you can find water. Now that water might be contaminated. That's why you need a water filter. That's also why you need a good water filter, because it may come to a point where you are drinking contaminated water. Nothing has killed more people than contaminated water. Okay, even throughout the course of our, our own history here in America, throughout the world, water is so important. Uh, you, need, you must have clean water. You can boil it. Boiling it is one thing, but it doesn't, you know, it's always good to have a filter where you can filter it as well. So I tell people, get a water filter, get two water filters, get three water filters. I think I, I can't even count how many water filters we have now just because I, I was getting them, you know, whenever I, you know, for all kinds of different re situations, different sizes, you know, for packing in backpacks and bug out bags or use around the homestead. We have a Berkey water filter in our kitchen. We have one in our outdoor kitchen. So water filters are a priority because you need clean water. So, and then maybe look at ways where you can capture water. Let's just say you are living in the city and there's no way you can get out, which I think is ridiculous. But if you just say you're in the city and, you can, and find, find a downspout on a building somewhere and put a container underneath it and capture that water and then save that water. Uh, you know, when I lived in the city, I had two 55 gallon drums of full of water situated in my basement. And if I needed that, there was 100 gallons of water, emergency water right there that I could use. Um, you can, for a time, get packages of bottled water. However, over the course of a year or so, the plastic is going to leach. The Whether it's food-friendly plastic or not, the, the flavor of that plastic is going to leach so that when you drink that water, it's going to taste disgusting to you. You don't want to do that. So um, I basically took two 55-gallon drums, plastic drums, and I put a silver dollar in each because silver is an antibacterial agent, and it kept any bacteria from growing in that water. Uh, it did a great job. It stayed there for years and years and years, and it was fine. Okay. So um, water, biggest thing is water. Get a good water filter. And uh, I had to just tag this on. I was corrected from the chat. It's actually two cups water, one cup rice. So uh, <laughs> even more important to have your, your water. And um, what about things like charcoal tablets and uh, alternative ways of purifying water? What are some of those? Uh, yeah, there's, there's iodine. Um, some people are allergic to iodine, so that might not be a good thing. I, I'm allergic to iodine. So... Um, and there's other different tablets out there, different chemicals you can put in there. But I try to avoid those. Number one, when you run out of them, what are you going to do? Okay, you can get a water filter that that's that's guaranteed up to a hundred thousand gallons, and man, that's a lot of water. So I doubt you're going to re you're never going to have to run out of that. That's going to you know provide you with water for a long time, especially if you have more than one of those. So um, I, I stay away from the tablets. I don't recommend you know the other chemical solutions that you can use to purify your water. Not to mention, it doesn't take any of the debris out of your water. It does make maybe makes it clean to eat or drink in, in a survival situation. But if we're talking about long term and and taste and all this other stuff, get a water filter. Get a water filter. All right. So what about the scenario of on the go travel? You can't carry your fifty gallon uh, tub of of purified water. What do people do if they're getting out of the city? It's already happened. They don't have any place yet. They got their bug out bag on their back. How do they survive when it comes to water? Okay, so you're, you're on the move or you're in a location where you don't have a lot of resources. You still have that water filter. Hopefully, you have that water filter. You can go to any ditch, any stream, any pond, any lake, and you can filter that water. And it'll be perfectly safe to drink. The, the water filters they make today are so precise and so well built. The good ones are uh, that you, you can take it from almost any source and have good, clean drinking water. That's not going to make you sick. Again, there, I don't think there's anything that's killed more people throughout history than water, bad water. Um, I'm always reminded of that game. Um, what was it? The Oregon Trail, right? And so... <laughs> Right? Remember that that game, the Oregon Trail? Yeah, of course. I remember when I was a kid, you know, we played that at the library in school, you know, and on those old Commodore 64 computers. And so, you know, you, you're running along the Oregon Trail and it comes up, you know, you have encountered bad, you have bad water, bad water. And then before you know it, somebody in your party has died of dysentery or died of whatever, you know, cholera. Well, it's all because of bad water. You know, you were drinking bad water, probably an animal or somebody died in that water and the bacteria grew so enormous that your body was overcame by it when you drank the water and you died too. So water, it's got to be get clean water and a good filter. Katadyne, again, is a company that makes some really good ones.
Yeah, I was probably one of the last generations that they actually had you play that game in school before it became outdated and they came out with all the new technology and, and right. the new, you know, games and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's it's you see, that's a great example is the Oregon Trail and, and how people had to really be ready for anything because in that game you would you would have all different scenarios happen to the characters that you were trying to get all the way to Oregon and um, and one of those um, I believe is is shelter and so let's talk a little bit about where people are going to be staying um, where they're going to be uh, getting away from the the mayhem and the craziness in the cities and and also what they're going to do if they're on the go all right so a lot of people I've talked to will say, well, when the balloon goes up, I'm either going to go to such and such's house and that, that's where I'll be. Or I'm just going to go to the national forest and I'll live in the forest and I'll make whatever cabin that I find there. Um, I would advise against those two strategies. Number one, does such and such friend of yours or family member of yours know that you're coming? And is he going to be able to accommodate you? Because it's this is going to be hard on him as well. And now he has additional mouths to feed and places to put up. So that doesn't always work out the best way that you think it's going to work out. And then going out into the middle of the wilderness and rural America, no matter where you live, uh, the people in the, who live in those places in rural America, if you can get there because roads will be, if roads are you know accessible and you can get the fuel to get to those places, um, they're not going to want you there. Okay. Uh, so you're going to have to deal with them. So don't just plan on showing up in the middle of rural America and thinking that, I'm in Shangri-La and I can survive. I can grow, you know, they're not going to be happy that you're here. Okay. Because you're some city folk and we don't want you, you know, bringing your cityness <laughs> because you can't even cook, you know, to our country. Um, and then national forest, same way with national forest. I mean, you go there and if everyone shows up at the national forest, you're going to have a problem. So you need to have a place to go. You need to have some forethought into this. This is part of the planning process. You need to be planning ahead. Find out if you if someone is going to give you a location to stay at on their place. Make sure that's already ready to go. Maybe make sure you have some supplies there ahead of time, pre pre positioned there, so that when you show up, you're just not showing up. If if you show up, you know, completely without any supplies and naked, you have some things there that you can benefit you with. You know, benefit your circumstances with. So pre planning, pre planning. When it comes to shelter, it's always pre planning. You know, we, there are some channels out there that will make a big deal and will showcase how you can survive in the wilderness. Um, and they'll they'll show you how to build a shelter out of twigs and branches and, and underbrush. And it's a nice shelter. But see, those things are in a survival situation like your plane just crashed and you're waiting for a rescue and you need to find a way to survive. And you're, you're just heading from point A to point B. But in a societal collapse, all that stuff goes out the window. None of that matters. It doesn't it's not going to matter. OK, you can't live full time forever in a little shelter, teepee shelter that you made with some brush and some branches. That's not going to work. So it's the pre planning, maybe finding a place where you can a small piece of acreage out in rural America where it's got a little cabin, a little Home Depot cabin. Say, so Zach, I don't have a lot of money. I bet most of you guys could find some things to sell around your house and cut off some expenses to buy a $3,000 Home Depot or Lowe's cabin and put it on an acre of land out there in rural America somewhere. I bet you could. Okay. In places in most of places in rural America, not Texas or some of these other places that you think are, are rural, but I'm talking about some real rural remote areas. You can get land pretty cheap, like less than a thousand an acre in some places. In some places I've done, I've done videos on this. I've done, I've done videos on this Jake, where there are places in Kansas and other parts of the Midwest that are giving land away for free. If you will come move there. Some of you guys are like, I can't leave the city. I don't have anywhere to go. There, there are towns who are, that are dying because of, you know, changes in our economy. They're giving land away for free. If you'll just come out there and move, you can have like your own Amazon business online and, and do stuff completely online. If you have an online ability to do, do business and live there for free, mm -hmm. they'll give you like five acres. So, I mean, there's no excuses. You can make it happen. If you want to make it happen, you will find a way to make it happen. All right. How about this? What are places you do not want to set up your bug out location at? What are places people should probably avoid whenever considering where they would go um, when, when it comes to shelter and where they would stay? 
Okay, so you want to look at what you want to look at water. You know, what's the rainfall every year? Um, you want to look at the community that's around those areas. Are they welcoming to outsiders? Um, what's the economy? What's you know in, the, in those areas that you may be choosing to move or find a place to put up shelter? Um, you know, you want to th just all those sorts of things that you know you want to consider when looking at. There's a guy by the name of Joel Skousen who has a really good book out there, and I, I if you just look it up, you'll find it. Joel Skousen is the author. And he has a book on all the different places that he would bug out to, and he ranks them, and he gives them a ranking system. He, you know, I don't know if it's letter grade or one through ten or whatever, but he gives them rankings on where are the best places in America to bug out to. And then he talks about places that you would not want to and why. So that would be a really helpful resource if you're interested in going down that route. That book uh, by Joel Skousen. Uh, just look it up; you'll find it. But uh, he's the author. One last thing is. Um uh, when it comes to shelter, people have like tents and, and hammocks and stuff like that that they can take on the go. Um, are, are those suitable for just travel? And, and what type would you want to take if you just need a bug out bag type shelter? Right. So a bug out bag type shelter, a bug out bag, for instance, I mean, a bug out bag is not something you live out of full time. A bug out bag is meant to get you from point A to point B where you can restock and re-equip. Okay, that's the purpose of a bug out. I'm bugging out here because I have somewhere to go where I know once I get there, I'll be taken care of or I can re-equip and then continue on. The type of tents that are sold today in like the big box stores, Walmart and other places are not, I mean, let's be honest. Most people, most people today go to, the, go to Walmart, buy an Ozark Trail tent and they use it for Sukkot. And then at the end of Sukkot, they throw it away. Because it broke, there were seams that came unripped, the zipper got stuck, and you know, little Johnny put a hole in the bottom of the tarp, and so it leaks water, and it rained, and it leaked like a sieve, and so they just get rid of it. It's a brand new tent, but they got rid of it. The tents that are sold in the big box stores are made with very poor quality. The tents <clears throat> that you hear about in the Bible that people carried, okay, and the tents that are really good quality today that you can buy, you need like a car to move them, or a cart, a horse cart something because they're big, heavy canvas. They have a lot, they have very sturdy poles or wooden poles and they're, they're meant to be used for long periods of time, continuous use year after year. And they can survive that long because they're that well made. But the stuff that you're buying at the big box stores will not last very long. So if you want to have something small, like an Ozark trail or something similar in your bug out bag, that's fine. Just realize it's not going to last very long. If you want a tent that you want to keep your family in, keep them dry, keep them safe, and give them some adequate shelter that's going to last a while, you're going to need more than a bug out bag to carry it. All right. So another aspect that we're going to be getting into is energy. And I know there's ways for people to operate energy-wise, off-grid, solar panels, and, you know, when, I don't know. When, so what is it to this topic? And people are going to be wanting to use electronics and stuff off grid. What are your thoughts there? All right. So if a societal collapse happens, throw your cell phones away because they're gone, right? Um, you know, they're, 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 you won't be needing those anymore. You're not going to be charging your tablets or iPads or whatever, or your laptops. Those are gone. Um, you know, but when it comes to energy, uh, there was really what, what was it energy, you know, 100 years ago? It was fuel. You know, you have fuel, fossil fuels. Um, I, I have an article on our website that the first um, fuel that's going to return quickly is going to be kerosene uh, because it's easily made. They've been making it since, I mean, recorded back in history, like the ninth century, um, I think BC and Persia. So um, they, they've been making kerosene for a long time. It's very easy to make. And uh, that'll be the first fuel that comes back. But the second one is when I think about energy, and also this goes into barterability, is ethanol. Ethanol is something that you can very easily make. All it takes is a sugar source, and really that's about it. Uh, you can make ethanol. And so that was a fuel that people could use. It was an energy source. And not only that, but if you make it right, um, you can it can be barter, a barter item for both medicinal and recreational use uh, that people will uh, trade you know, for. It's, it can be in something in very high demand. So uh, since the beginning of this country, in fact, George Washington, uh, when he retired from being president, he went back and began making his own energy in the form of a still ethanol. That was what that was what he did till he died was make ethanol. 
So we also have like the concept of needing warmth and fire. Uh, what what should people do in that situation? Are you talking about in, like for energy that way? Yeah. So like uh, yeah. first, maybe on the go, um, what is the best way to be able to very easily and quickly start a fire if they need to? Um, I mean, you need energy, you need fire to cook stuff. Um, right. And then and then we can kind of get moved towards uh, like travel and, and gasoline and, and stuff to get your vehicle different places. Right. So let's just look at some scenarios in terms of um, Sarajevo. I know it wasn't Sarajevo. Yeah, it was Sarajevo. Sarajevo, when, when their collapse happened in 1995, there was a really amazing story of a guy who lived in the city and he did very well during that collapse because he knew how to make energy. Again, distillation, ethanol production. What he did, is, and he never told anybody his secret, but he always had uh, basically diesel fuel to trade. And he did really well in the bartering, in the bartering. But it's basically energy he's creating, and and he basically used fire. So we'll, we'll get into fire starting in a minute. But he would take a, a pine tree, a number of pine trees on his on his land in the backyard, and he would drill those, and he tapped the oil, the sap from the pine trees, and then he distilled that into diesel fuel and sold it because they have a lot different cars over in in that part of the world than they have here. Most people don't have diesel cars. Over there, almost all the cars are diesel. And so you have a lot more fuel options that you can run on those with a little bit of uh, finagling with the engine. And so he was basically making fuel and supplying people and trading, and his family did quite well. It was after the war when everyone came to him and said, what did you do? How did you get all this diesel? Everyone just figured out you magically had diesel. Where did you get this? And he said, I made it. I made it at home. I distilled it. I learned how to operate a distillery. I learned how to make a still, something that people have been doing for thousands of years, and I made my own diesel fuel. It's that simple. And the guy got through this collapse in Sarajevo that was horrible for so many other people because he had the knowledge to do that. So there, learn how to make your own energy. Okay, I'm not talking about really solar or wind turbines uh, because that stuff, you know, I have solar panels here in our homestead, but every so often my batteries go dead or a battery has an issue, or there's another part that needs to be fixed, or something happens. Like one time we had our, our wind turbine get struck by lightning. Well, if you're in a societal collapse, it only works so long as there's a, until there's a problem that arises, and all that stuff goes away. Hmm. You can't, you can't, it's just, so you, you, you can't get parts. So that's all gone. So what was energy before the energy we know today, you know, at our electrical power plants and nuclear energy and all that stuff? Well, it was fuel production. Fuel production, fuel production, fuel production, something that you can easily do once you obtain the knowledge on how to do it. Fire starting. Obviously, you need to make fire to be able to, be able to make that fuel because it takes fire to do it. Um, but fire starting, you know, really what it comes down to, I had a guy tell me years ago, and I thought it was a, it was a great saying. He said, if Daniel Boone had carried a big glider, he would have used it. So, you know, everyone's out there trying to learn how to survive and make fire with sticks, you know, and how to rub two rocks together and make fire and pat themselves on the back for that. And that those are pretty neat skills to have. And I've learned how to do that. I've learned how to make fire with sticks and, and, and a bow drill. I've learned how to make fire. But you know what? You can go to Walmart today and buy like a 10 pack of lighters for like, I don't know what, five bucks. I mean, put that, we have lighters scattered everywhere around our homestead because we use them for kerosene lanterns, for lighting fires in the outdoor kitchen, for lighting our stove in the wintertime, for lots of reasons. Go buy 100 lighters, 100 Bic lighters, and put them all throughout your stuff and your home, and you've got fire forever. You know, if Daniel Boone could have used a Bic lighter, he would have. <laughs> he would have. Why would you not? So, I mean, and not only that, let's just be, let's be, let's be honest here, too. There's a million different varieties of fire starters out there, you know, that are real easy to get fires. You know, they have all kinds of these magnesium instant fire sticks and all kinds of things, gimmicks. And, and then a lot of them work really well. You can buy these online for just a few dollars. Um, if you want to put something like that in your bug out bag, go ahead. But, you know, in my bug out bag is a big lighter or actually multiple big lighters. Wow. Great advice. <laughs> Easy, simple. Just go get some lighters at the store. <laughs> yeah, simple. It'll last forever. 
All right. What about the biggest draw of energy that we have um, our vehicles and, and transportation using gasoline or diesel to get different places and the other things that would eat up your energy? Well, that's another thing, too. The benefits that I mentioned in Sarajevo, that guy who was making diesel, all the little cars, big cars, I said, all over there use diesel. A majority of them, very few are actually petrol or gas. So what do you do in America when most of the cars are gas? I think you're going to be up a creek. Most of your vehicles are not going to be working once you run out of gas. And there's no fuel that you can really make that can easily be consumed by those vehicles unless major modifications to those engines can take place. But you have to go out and buy the parts for those engines to convert them. Um, you know, so you're not going to be able to do it. It's just that that's it. So um, you're going to be in trouble at that point. I just think it's going to go away. It should not be part of your planning. It should not be part of your if you want to really figure out transportation, maybe get a diesel. Maybe get a you know a truck that's a diesel truck and that you can and they sell kits online and convert your uh, you know your vehicles now to something that you can make uh, the fuel for. But um, uh, and there's lots of kits online you can buy lots of knowledge on forums and internet websites where they teach you how to do this and show you in videos how to do this. So learn that knowledge now and then maybe convert your vehicle and just try it out for a while so you have that hands-on knowledge. But I think for the most part your vehicles are going to go away and. Um, we, you know, we've prepared for that plan here. And at that point, horses are going to come back in style quick, fast, and in a hurry. <laughs> so what about people who need to get out or be able to travel during the scenario of a societal collapse? Uh, I mean, you, are they just going to have this one tank of fuel and then boom, they're on foot? Or, you know, what's the what's the mentality people need to be prepared for? That, that's why I tell you to get out of the city because you have that one tank of fuel. I mean, let's be honest. How often do you keep your fuel at full tank? Not not that often. <laughs> right. So let's just say you got 300 miles at a full tank of gas that you can go for your car. I mean, it's going to vary depending on vehicle, but let's just say 300 miles you can go before you're going to need a refuel. Um, you're not going to get it. So wherever that 300 miles you know, line ends, that's where you are. And it better not be in the backyard of Joe Schmo Farmer who doesn't like outsiders and he's already you know, turned away a few hundred dozen of uh, people showing up at his door, you know, you're going to be in trouble. So that's why I tell people, get out of the city now. Let's do this now. Let's, let's prepare for this now because, again, we're $20 trillion in debt. More than that, the country's never been in more debt than it is now amongst the people. And we have no moral compass anymore in this country. So we know where this is headed. Let's stop playing denial. Let's stop, you know, not thinking this is going to happen and prepare because it has happened in history in the past. It's going to happen again. So that, don't get caught in the city. I tell you, people, get out of the city. All right. So another aspect to surviving societal collapse is the community that you bring around you and the people you decide to tether up with. So let's talk about community. So let's, let's say you moved out of the city and you've got your piece of property. Let's say it's 10 acres, five acres, even an acre somewhere in a rural town and or outside of a rural town. First thing you ought to do is just go out there and make friends with your neighbors. You know, make a pie, make some banana bread, and show up at their doorsteps and introduce yourself and, you know, let them know that you're not a meth head because that's a big thing in, in rural America today is that they're always worried about meth heads moving in. Well, let them know you're not and then introduce themselves and, and offer, hey, listen, if you ever need help with anything, let me know. I'd be happy to help you. Or even better yet, once you get to know them a little bit, have them teach you some things. There's very few ways you can – uh, gain a relationship with people that's a strong relationship than showing them that you need their help, that you want their knowledge, that you want them to mentor you in some way because they feel needed, they feel important, and they, they don't often get that from most people in our culture. So, um, and, and, and be honest, most of these people out in rural America know so many cool things that are going to help you in hard times that it's not even funny. So, it really would behoove you to go out there and learn what they know, especially the old timers. So um, community, um, I would, I get a lot of people who say, well, you know, we should start our own communities of like-minded individuals and we'll all live on the same piece of land that never works. Okay. And, and on the communities that, ha that have been around a while who do that, uh, the, the, the door is a revolving door. It's very, very high turnover. Don't subject yourself and your family to that sort of stress. You need to have your own property, your own place, your own belongings. Don't try to live in a commune somewhere. That's not community. That's communism. 
Okay. You want to live in a community, in a town, in a place where you have your own stuff and you can make friends and network with your neighbors. Um, I, I buy milk from uh, a neighbor down the road. You know, her cow has milk, a lot of milk. And so we buy milk. Uh, if I need different things, there's different people I network with to get things from and, and they network with me to get things from. And so, you know, we rely on each other. You want to build those relationships. Again, you want to do it before, uh, sooner rather than later. Um, so that you can have those established relationships that you can count on. Something you'd mentioned earlier about how people today don't even know their no neighbors next door. And I would say you're more likely to have your neighbor kick down your door and try to take your stuff when you don't know them and you're not their friend. So um, it's definitely important to go and, and reach out to other people. But that also brings up this whole concept of what if things go sour, the relationships go sour? How do you protect your families? How do you keep people from taking the advantage of you? And what is the security that goes along with this uh, this time? Um, well, this is this is, for lack of a better word, the sexiest part of preparing and survival. Okay, everyone wants to talk about the guns. Everyone wants to talk about you know firearms and shotguns and and AR-15s and AK-47s and all this stuff. And I, while we do have a lot of that here, um, and I think it's an important part. I think you should have a pistol. I think you should, should probably have a rifle or two. Um, I think every able-bodied person in your household ought to know how to operate those devices and be proficient with them. Uh, however, I also think you need to get training uh, on some, on those weapons. Uh, good classes, some advanced classes, not just a concealed carry class offered you know, to your local church group or something like that. I think you need to go out and get some advanced training. Uh, at least a few people in, in your household ought to have that, at least one person. So um, security, I, I think, again, that goes according with, you know, Knowing your neighbors, um, having a firearm, being trained in that firearm, um, putting up different barriers maybe around your homestead to to keep honest people honest. You know, that was always a part of farming and agriculture in rural America. Um, you know, most people didn't leave their doors unlocked because they didn't need to. Well, today you need to. Again, the, the, the moral law line between right and wrong has been blurred, and so it's not there anymore. You need to lock your doors. You need to keep your stuff uh, uh, maintained and, and watched over and things like that. So fences are a good thing. Um, you know, knowing you know how, where your fences are, knowing where your property lines are, uh, that's all very important. But again, this is more after you get in onto a homestead, after you get out of the city. Let's just say you're living in the city. What do you do about security? I would recommend, um, you know, first getting out of the city, but there are different security systems that you can get put in place in like an apartment in like um, a subdivision. There's some, some things that don't rely necessarily all on electricity. Most of the security systems that you're going to find out there today are wireless, some of the good ones. And so using some of those systems, um, I believe there's a, I can't remember the name of them. X10 was one of them that I've used in the past really good. Uh, but there's lots of security systems that you can get out there that are wireless and you can even operate them on batteries. So let's just say the grid goes down tomorrow. It's all gone. You can put a battery up and still maintain security in your home, in your subdivision, in your apartment, in the city. Okay. But I, you have a, you have a, a battery that you bought at the store. It's on standby. You keep it trickle charged because you have a trickle charger outlet that you used before the grid went down. And maybe now you have a solar panel that you can hang out your window to keep it charged and going. It doesn't take a lot of electricity to keep these security systems going. They're very, very low voltage. And so just a small solar panel out your bedroom window during the day would keep these things charged and going and keep you secure. So let's just say, you know, uh, you have a camera out there, you know, where you need to look at something and it's wireless. So you can run a line to, to that battery. Um, and it, it transmits the, the signal remotely, wirelessly. That, that stuff is very common today, so take advantage of it. Um, other than that, I don't know. Is there any ideas on security you would have <laughs> besides that? Well, uh, a baseball bat. Uh, if you run out of ammo, uh, which you sh probably should stock up and get prepared in terms of that, but you want something, you know, blunt force trauma or something that you can defend yourself with in the case that you don't have a gun anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you, you want to definitely be um, – your head on a swivel. You want to understand who's around you and you want to be aware of the situations you're in because, 
you know, people even with guns, they can be taken unaware if they're not being cognizant of what's going on around them. Uh, that's uh, some of the suggestions I got, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, a big part yeah. of that, just, I think, goes into knowing your neighbors and being friendly with them. And I know that's hard to do in the city because today, if your neighbor comes up and talks to you, you think they're a wacko. You know, why are you talking to me? You know, we, this is something that doesn't happen in the city. So it's hard for that to happen in the city. But, uh, you know, I, as far as ammo goes, never, never run out of ammo. Buy more. <laughs> All right. So on the same topic of security, let's talk about what some of the dangers during societal collapse would be. Where do people need to be paying attention to? Where, you know, where is the danger going to be coming from? I think the, the danger, the majority of the danger is going to be the people's unrest. We have never known hunger in this country. Every, every week I volunteer at a food pantry in our town, and there's a lot of people who are considered poor and they all know all the different churches and places where you can go and get free food, loads of it. And so a lot of times I'll help these people. And a lot of them are open on you know the same days during the week. And they do that so that the people can come to town once a week and make all the stops and get all their food. And I load groceries in people's cars that are stacked full of groceries, produce, breads, desserts, meats, whatever. They're stacked. And, you know, they have food, and these are the poor people in our country. And some of them really are poor, but let's be honest. They're not starving. The majority of them are overweight, sometimes obese, very much overweight. And, you know, they're eating good. They're not starving. So we have never known hunger in this country, never truly known hunger in this country, not for a long time. And uh, people out there say, so many kids are starving in America. No, they're not. Because there's a million places for them to go get food. And if you're if they really are starving, it's because they haven't found those places yet and they need to go be educated on where to get those. Because we have an abundance in this country. We are a very, very, very rich nation. So when trouble comes and we really are going to learn how to find hunger, you know, know, know what hunger means, and we can't go to the store to find groceries, and we can't go to these food banks to get free handouts, and we can't you know, get our government EBT cards and checks in the mail, what are you going to do? You're going to panic and you're going to go out and you're going to try to figure out a way to feed your family. And if that means robbing the neighbor next to you, because again, there's no line, distinct line between right and wrong in America today, the moral fibers of our country have been eroded. What's going to stop people from robbing their neighbor? Because I see you have you have some food, you know, I saw, I saw that big old case of whatever it was in your garage one day when you had it open and you were talking to me or whatever, they're, they're going to become a real danger. So, you know, going back to security, do you have a way to defend yourself? Do you have a way to maintain your household? Again, get out of the city, but let's just say you, you didn't and you're in the suburbs now and you're, you're in this metropolitan, these large metropolitan areas, how are you going to stay safe? Uh, because I think food is going to be the number one tipping point when you can't get food. The second big one is medicines. They, ha they have no way to replenish their psychotropic drugs, their whatever pain pills they're on or whatever it is. And so now there's a, most people are going to go through withdrawal periods on whatever medication they've been on and they're not going to be in the right minds. That's going to be a, a, a big danger. So it's going to be a point where you, you don't even want to go out of your house. You know, so what do you do? Um, get out of the city. <laughs> <laughs> have I said that? Have I said that enough yet? <laughs> yeah, I think we've but, driven the point home quite well. And but well, well, really, because here, here's the thing you're facing: you're a father, you're a husband, you have kids, and now the world around you is going crazy. You just saw, you know, yesterday your neighbor across the way was raped and killed, and you have people over here starving, and they're 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 robbing you, and they're going door to door, and the, your neighbor was going to work the other day. He found a place to go to, to to work. His job was still intact, and he got carjacked on the way to work, and I'm, I'm, only, I'm only repeating things that have happened in Buenos Aires. Read about Buenos Aires and Argentina in 2001. And read about the scenarios. That's what they would do. They would basically go door to door and they would break down, break down your doors and people would just barricade large steel plates in front of their doors. I mean, homes became fortresses in Buenos Aires because that's what it was. And if you did go out in your car and someone stopped you and tried to stop your car, you just plowed right through them and killed them if you could. Because it, the stop at a stop, even at stoplights, was an invitation for you to get uh, carjacked. 
no one even adhered to the stoplights anymore because if you stopped at a stoplight, you were chances are you were going to get carjacked. So you just kept going. You didn't stop. And so um, that's the reality. That's what's actual history. That's what's actually happened. So, you know, to, to keep reminding people to get out of the city is not so when you're facing that kind of scenarios that have happened in the past where you have no moral authority anymore and you have people who are panicking because they can't get their medication and they can't get their food. And meanwhile, they're staring their wife and children in the face because they're, they really are hungry because now they know what hunger is. They'll, they'll be desperate. They'll do anything. And so that's what we're facing here. Get out of the city. If you happen to be in the city, you better plan to make your house a fortress. You talk much about security and community and really at that point, I mean, no matter how well you know your neighbor, if your neighbor is staring down his children, his little girl or little boy, and they're, they, they've gone their third night with no food, and they know that you have food. So if the dollar collapsed tomorrow or if society collapses tomorrow, how long till people start to freak out? How long do people have to prepare if, if things hit the fan right now? How long before people start killing each other for their neighbor's goods and, and, and things start really ramping up to an extreme point? 72 hours. You got 72 hours, in my opinion. Some people would say less. Some people would say more. But I'm telling you, before it starts, 72 hours, because people are at that point, they're going to, they have, let's just say they didn't get their medication that they needed. They were supposed to fill it out yesterday, and the societal collapse happened tomorrow. And, and so they need it now. Well, they, they can't go get it. It's, it's done. We're, you know, Walgreens is closed, CVS or whatever pharmacy you go is closed. Um, I think you got 72 hours before the shelves are bare and people start really panicking because they have never dealt with this situation before. We don't know how. We don't know how to rely on others. We don't have a moral authority, a moral compass anymore. 72 hours before stuff starts really getting bad. So when I was living in the city and I knew all this stuff and I was desperately trying to get out, trying to find a homestead, figure out a way to, you know, whatever it was going to cost to get out. I knew I had 72 hours. I was prepared. My family was prepared. Pack whatever we can pack. And, and we had certain things set aside that would be packed and go. And we had uh, already uh, deals with people who lived in rural America. Um, we knew some people in Houston, Missouri, who were going to take us in and allow us to work on their farm and build a house there. And that was the deal we had with them because they were more elderly and they were going to, they knew they needed us and we needed them. And so it was a really good cooperation. So we were, we had worked that deal out ahead of time. OK, so that's where we were going to go. But I had 72 hours to get there. I had fuel cans if I needed to. I knew I, I was going to have enough fuel to get there. No problem. But that's where I was going to go. And I wasn't going to stop until I pulled another driveway. So I say 72 hours. Another thing that people are bringing out in the chat is the type of people that you're around. While today your neighbor who's not a believer might be uh, very kind and, and nice, um, unless you are surrounding yourselves with people you trust and you understand that they're going to be applying biblical values, somebody who is nice to you one day, but doesn't hold to the same biblical standards you do, they could be going crazy the next day. So um, what is the fine line between uh, trusting somebody too much and, and, and trusting them at all? You know, and this is really harsh, um, but I, and I don't remember who said it, but, Whoever said this, you can look it up online and find out who was attributed to this quote. Have a plan to kill everyone you meet. It's that simple. Mathis. Because when General well, Mathis. <laughs> was it really? No, yeah, I, I, no I, I think he's quoting somebody else because I knew about oh, this okay. long before. Yeah, it's have a plan to kill everyone you meet. Because you know, you can trust somebody, you know, only a certain to a certain extent, especially if they don't have the same moral fibers that you do, the same moral beliefs, um, and you you have not tested them through other stressful times and you don't, you don't know how they have reacted in other stressful times during their life. You don't know how they're going to react during this stressful time in their, in their life. So um, it comes down to have a plan to kill everyone. And it, it's harsh for some people because, you know, thou shall not kill. Well, it's not killed with self-defense. And some people are like, well, we should rely on God. We, so that's the whole thing. People have a real hard time with this whole talk because if this happens, Jake, I'm going to rely on God. God's going to take care of me. God's going to provide the food I need. He's going to provide the security I need. See, that's why it's so dangerous to confuse God with Uncle Sam. Because you have lived in a world today where Uncle Sam has taken care of all that for you. 
But see, Uncle Sam's have come and gone all throughout history. Okay, and there's nothing in the Bible that's against self-defense. There's nothing in the Bible against defending your family, defending your own life. Okay, we see numerous times where Hebrews throughout the Bible defended themselves with violence. And it was granted to them victory by God himself. So it's, it's you know, where are you, where is your righteousness at? That's that we've, you know, we can go down that. That's a whole preparedness topic in itself. But there, there comes a time when you're going to have to be able to do those things uh, that you would not normally think about doing if it means to safeguard the future for you and your family. And um, you know, that's just the harshness and reality of, of, of these situations. Again, history tells the tale. You know, empires have risen and fallen. The, 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 the Christians, the early first century Christians who were fed to the lions in the Roman Colosseum did not want to be there. They were stripped of all ability to self-defense. They were captured and they had no hope. Okay. At some point, if I get fed to a lion, it's because I have run way out of ammo. Okay. And they got me and they fed, they fed me to a lion, but I'm going to fight that lion until my very last dying breath. I'm going to fight all the way down. And and if you don't if you're not, if you're not that kind of person, well then you're just gonna that that'll be your fate. But a lot of us are, a lot of us are not going to be like that. All right. So we talked a little bit about the people in the society who freak out. They need food, water, whatever, and they start to turn on each other. But what about outside? Um, uh, aspects to societal collapse, like an invading army. Uh, what do you do if Red Dawn happens? <laughs> What's the situation there? Uh, Red Dawn will never happen because there's too many there's too many guns in this country, and there's no way to quick more quickly unify a country's populace than by invading it from an outside army, uh, especially when they're defending their own homeland. So um, people often quote that Japanese general who said that no invading army could ever invade the United States because a rifle will be behind every blade of grass. People today have said that that general never said that, that it was completely made up. I don't know if it's true or not. However, the sentiment is correct because this country has too many guns and too many people who know how to use them. So you're never going to effectively have a Red Dawn scenario, invading army scenario. The best way this country, the only way this country is going to fall and falter, falter and fall is going to be because the moral fiber has been, has had a cavity within itself and has degraded to a point where we basically kill ourselves. Um, you know, a fight between right, right and wrong here in this country, which is already happening. You, know, there, you look at the vitriol and our, on our headlines, our news headlines today, it's amazing that it hasn't come to that already. We haven't had a second civil war already. So um, we, we're, I don't think we're going to have to wait about, worry about the, the invading Soviets or Chinese or at some point. That, that, that'll never, even a billion Chinese. Number one, there's no logistics in the world possible to get all those billion people to our shoreline. So again, not, not going to happen. Um, but that's something we don't have to worry about. Thank goodness. We do have to worry about the economic collapse. The economic collapse if China really wants to, to destroy the United States, they're not going to invade us. They're going to call into question our treasury bonds that they hold the majority of and collapse us that way. That, that's, 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 that's simple. <laughs> so um, another aspect to that is if there's not invading armies, um, there's always the talk of, of nuclear attacks and and cities vaporizing and uh, fallout and all that what about surviving in the case of like a like a cold war scenario where everybody was preparing for the nuclear explosions happening all in the big military installations and surviving during nuclear fallout what do people do in those situations um uh, this is where a lot of misinformation comes in into play um nuclear nuclear war is only a concern again if you're living in the city uh, so again, another reason to get out of the city. There are nuclear targets. The Soviets have, the, or the Russians have their nu nuclear targets. We have I had our nuclear targets. About the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, we kind of sidelined all of our nuclear strategy, nuclear force adherence, um, and kind of went with more a lot of the guerrilla warfare. De you know, it's when Desert Storm was kicking off. But the the, the Russians never abandoned their their nuclear strategy. In fact, they continue to build on it and plan on it. Uh, so if you're only in a nuclear, you're only in a nuclear target zone if you live in a city or near a military base or near somewhere that has 
major strategic significance, like um, some a place where a lot of resources are generated for energy, things like that. But for the most part, rural America is left unscathed, and everyone has this idea in their mind that nuclear war means we're all going to be vaporized. But that's not the that's not the truth. If you look at the the normal tonnage of a nuclear warhead, um, its impact radius is not that significant. It's going to vaporize everything within its impact zone for sure. But everything outside of it, even you know, well outside of that range, you know, is is going to be almost untouched, unscathed. And yeah, we have nuclear fallout, but the reality is nuclear fallout is only, I think, 86 days. The half-life is an 86-day time period until it's basically gone to a point where it can't hurt you anymore. So we look at things like Chernobyl and other places that have had uh, nuclear meltdowns, and those places can't be inhabited for the next thousand years. Well, it's because that's the, that was a place where the nuclear material solidified itself in the ground. But that's not what happens with a nuclear blast. In a nuclear blast, most of the time, the blast happens uh, above the ground. Okay, that's what that's what happens when these nuclear these uh, reentry vehicles happen. They, they they explode just above the ground, and they vaporize everything in that immediate area. But then the half life of the debris that's all been radioactive now that's now radioactive is only eighty six days. So in eighty six days, that's all the only amount of time that you have to that you need to protect yourself. I mean, let's be honest. Could you live in a hole? I mean, a hole. Could you live in a hole for eighty six days if it meant your survival? Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> sure, sure you could. So if, if really all it comes down to is a, is a, is an amount of mass having a certain amount of mass or as much mass as you can get together, you know. If, if a nuclear, I don't have a basement, but if I did, I, I, if a nuclear blast happened in some nearby city or military base, I would basically live in the centermost part of my house for the next 90 days, and I would put as much mass on top of and around my house as I possibly could before the fallout got here. And, and in that room, I would, I would put as much mass around that room and around the, around the rooms of my house as I possibly could until that fallout got here. And that would protect my family probably enough to keep us well, uh, very well, until, you know, 86 days was, was over and I could come out. Hmm. All right. So we've talked a little bit about security. We've talked about community. In interacting with community, a integral part of that is barterability. So let's talk about how you're going to be interacting and trading and buying things when economic collapse happens and you can't use that dollar bill. Um, yeah, so I've had a lot of people tell me, let's just start with gold and silver. I've had a lot of people tell me, say, Zach, when we're all starving and the economic collapse happens, no one's going to want your gold or silver. Again, let's go back through historical examples that we have, Sarajevo, Buenos Aires, and um, Venezuela. Those places, you can find lots of dealers of gold and silver because lots of people have gold and silver jewelry. I remember in Buenos Aires, I was reading articles about it from a guy named Furfowl who was posting his experiences of living during this whole time during the collapse. And he says, overnight, there popped up like hundreds of shops taking in gold and silver to give you money to get by during their, their collapse. And they were taking in this gold and silver, whether coins, whether jewelry, whatever. And he actually said, he said, the best form of money, if you want gold and silver, which is good, um, good thing to have during a collapse is not really coins, even though coins are great, but just jewelry, because you can get jewelry at a much lower price, much lower premium than you can, you know, coins. And so if you had like gold chains or gold bracelets or silver chains or silver bracelets, whatever, silver jewelry rings, you know, whatever, those things were worth a whole lot more because you could cut them up into pieces. Coins are a lot harder to cut. But a lot of these chains can become unlinked and you can use the links uh, to get by for this week. You can buy this week's food with one link of gold from your gold chain, depending on how big it was. And so, you know, people will tell me, Zach, oh, it's gold and silver. That's ridiculous. You don't, you don't no one's, you can't eat your gold and silver, Zach. Well, you're ridiculous because history tells you otherwise. When societal and economic collapse happens, gold and silver keep people alive. They keep their families fed because you will never find a society anywhere that's going to turn down gold and silver as a barter item or an item for payment. It won't happen because that gold and silver can be taken out of that societal collapse zone and moved to other places where things aren't so bad or other people will trade it. It'll go into a bigger economic 
uh, network system that people will use it for bar. They'll, it'll get melted down into bars and uh, governments will use it. They'll, they'll, they'll take it. And there's no way you're ever going to end a market for gold and silver ever. It's been gold for five. It's been money for 5,000 years. It's going to be money for, until the end of Mas when Messiah comes, then people will throw their gold and silver in the streets and it won't matter anymore. But that's then when an economic collapse happens, history tells us that gold and silver is a good thing to have. The second best or the third best thing besides gold and silver is again fuel. Being able to make distillates, whether it's kerosene, whether it's gasoline, ethanol, uh, whiskey, moonshine, whatever, being able and having the knowledge to distill something, sugar, a sugar product or a fossil fuel product into a usable fuel is going to be priceless, just like gold and silver. So, um, and history again tells us this. You look at the collapses that have happened, Sarajevo. Argentina, Venezuela, and other places throughout history, uh, it's been distillation products. Barterability, not only that, it's used for fuels and other reasons, it, but it's also used as, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's recreational that people will always have a demand for. Hmm. All right. So what else would be some good items that people could stock up on to barter? Um, I mean, I know ammo and, and, and guns would be good <clears throat> things to have. What are some other things that people could trade with? So one of the things that we have in abundance here in our homestead that we've been doing now for a while, we've been gardening, we've become very successful and good at gardening, we have seeds. Seeds are an amazing thing that you can barter and trade for that people will take, they'll use it, and they'll grow it, and then they'll start saving their own seeds. So seeds are a good thing. Once you learn how to garden, learn how to save your seeds and use them year after year, always save extra because now, in fact, we're going to be going to the Baker Creek Spring Planting Festival here next week, and we'll be bringing lots of seeds that we have saved, we have harvested, and we have packaged, and now we're going to be selling them. So you'll be you'll see a lot of seed trading going on at that festival. So seeds are a big item. Uh, then you have bullets. Bullets are good. You know, ammunition, different calibers of ammunition, common calibers. If you're looking at storing up ammunition, store the common calibers. 12-gauge shotgun, 22 long rifle, 38 special, 9 millimeter, um, 7.62, uh, 5.56. Common calibers that most people would have a need for. Hunting rounds like the 270 and the 30 odd 6 and the 308. Those things are going to be in high demand during a collapse because uh, they'll have the guns to use them. So if you buy a number of... of uh, common caliber ammunitions that you can keep and set aside uh, for barter and trade, then, you know, that, that would be very high in demand indeed. Another thing that people who have not really gotten into this mindset yet might have trouble with <clears throat> is establishing a value to these different items comparative to what they would be purchasing with these different items. So how would you place a value on uh, a case of bullets or uh, on on that particular civil, sil silver coin when the dollar value is no longer associated with it? Uh, you can't because it's all going to come down to what the trade's about. I mean, if you really need that item that you've got right there, let's just say it's a medicine for uh, animal livestock that you really need because you have issues with some, you know, something over with your livestock, you know, trading a hundred rounds of five, five, six ammo for that, for that medicine that you desperately need, you know, you're going to make the trade. Whereas normally you, you might, if you, if you didn't really need it, but Hey, you know, I'd like to have some of that in case it ever did happen. I may trade you 20 rounds instead of a hundred. Does that make sense? It's all going to depend on what the trade is and how, how, ne how necessary the trade is uh, for, for happening so that you get what you want. And the guy who's trading you gets, gets what he wants. Do you have any advice for people on the process of bartering and how to best and most effectively go about it? I have a plan to kill everyone you meet. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, you know, again, it's about st establishing relationships. So, you know, you're going to try to establish relationships. You're going to try to trade with people who you know. Um, so it's hard and dangerous to go into somewhere where you don't know. Let's just say, you know, you live on the outskirts of somewhere and you're going to have to travel five miles to get to a marketplace in a town you know, hopefully you get there in one piece. You don't get robbed along the way. And it, once you get there, who can you trust? Well, again, it's about establishing relationships. It'd be great if you had been in that town for the last 10 years and you knew a lot of people in that town and they knew you. And so when you show up, you're not a stranger. Not only that, but when you, on your way to get to that town, you know most of the neighbors along the way because you've been living there for 10 years and you've established relationships and 
you stopped at such and such watermelon stand every year and bought his watermelons and you stopped over at this lady and, and bought some of her eggs, you know, one time. And, and you know, that, that sort of thing. You've developed relationships with those people. Um, so you don't have to worry so much about bartering and trading with them. But if you're showing up willy nilly and you've no, you don't know anybody, they don't know you. There's going to be a trust issue here. All right. So another aspect to societal collapse. Well, right now we can heavily depend on the medical industry to keep us healthy, to keep us sewn up whenever we fall and scratch our leg or whatever. So what about life preservation in terms of medical necessities during a societal collapse? Because we're not going to have these big hospitals. We're not going to have convenient care. We're not going to have the emergency room. We're not going to have the ambulance showing up at your front door. What do people do? Um, it's about preparing and education. So, uh, you know, you could today you can throw enough dollars at any problem and, and get immediate satisfaction. But education comes with time and experience. So learn how to use a tourniquet. Go out and buy a tourniquet. You can get tourniquets on a lot of different websites for free. You can get Quick Clot, which is a, a, a blood stoppage um, gauze and different – there's Cellox and different ones, different brands out there that are, are – are, really good about stopping heavy bleeding. Um, you can get lots of medical supplies out there to purchase, but also learning how to use these is very important. So I've attended seminars before where they take a chicken and they cut the chicken's skin and you have to sew it back up. So it's a dead chicken and they give you this raw chicken and, and they cut the skin and you have to sew it back up the skin and do a suture. Well, if you've never done a suture before, that's a great way to learn because you're, you're using a dead chicken that you would normally you're going to eat. Um, obviously, but you're just using it as a teaching tool. There's lots of websites and YouTube channels where you can go, and a lot of these YouTube channels actually give seminars on some of the stuff. Patriot Nurse is a really good one out there. A lot of you guys probably have heard of her. The Patriot Nurse actually gives seminars. She has paid classes and courses and gives really good information, this sort of information. What would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation? It's, a, it's an economic collapse, a societal collapse, and you have a gunshot wound. How are you going to treat it? Also learning about different medicines, learning about some of the medicines that you can make yourself. You remember that saying, you ever watch Mary Poppins, a, you know, a, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Yep. Medicine used to taste horrible because a majority of medicine was, again, made with distillates that people made themselves by making a vodka tincture and um, using whatever herbs inside that tincture, inside that vodka to infuse the medicinal properties of those herbs into the vodka. And then they would strain off the herbs, throw the herbs away. And you had that tincture. And when it came down to a sickness or something you had to take that tincture for, it tasted horrible. And so what they would do is you'd have a spoonful of honey or sugar and you'd have a spoonful of tincture and you'd take the, or take the, the honey first or sugar first and then the tincture and it all go down at once. So it would be more palatable. Well, learning how to make your own tinctures, we've made a lot of our own tinctures here. We've made tinctures for poison ivy. We've made tinctures for uh, flu and cold and stuff like that. There's lots of different tinctures you can learn how to make. Learn how to make those and then make them. You know, actually get some experience, hands-on experience. It's as, it's as easy as going out and picking whatever plant you want to make it for and then going buying a bottle of vodka at the local liquor store and making it. It's very simple. I, in fact, I have videos on how to make some of these tinctures on our website. So, again, it's, it's about experience. Med medicines are going to be gone. Learn what used to be medicine. Some of these medicines were snake oil salesmen. I get it. But a lot of these medicines were very effective, and they have a history of more than a 1,000 years of people using them effectively against different ailments. I've always been curious because I, I'm I, the community I'm in here. There's a lot of people who make tinctures with vodka. Why is it that vodka specifically is used for tinctures? It's usually the cheapest alcohol that you can get, um, and it's all you need. You can really do it with any alcohol. Uh, any, any alcohol will draw the medicinal properties out, um, but you're not going to waste, you know, uh, a, a whiskey that's been sitting in a barrel for you know, 10 years or five years, <laughs> you know, aging to get a, 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 the taste that you want um, for medicine where you can go out and buy vodka and you're going to get the same result from it. So, <laughs> And uh, one of our fellowships, we had a uh, 
Ryan Lucas, who is a practice going to be a practicing nurse. He was in the military. He shared with us that the most important thing for any uh, medical bug out kit is a, uh, a, uh, I just <laughs> slipped my mind the very term, but a, um, tourniquet a tourniquet yeah and um and it doesn't matter if you have bandages and all that stuff if you bleed out in a few minutes and uh we had a a little episode where he was demonstrating and he says hey jake come up here and i want you to be my my uh my model for my my little tourniquet demonstration i thought i was just you know, you know get, gonna get away with just this little simple tourniquet demonstration so i get down on the <laughs> ground and he pulls out this tourniquet and he jumps down and kneels on my leg like heavy duty and he cranks that thing away <laughs> and i'm sitting there freaking out like oh it hurts um and uh and it was just so <laughs> it was really abrupt but it taught me a lesson that i will not forget and that's uh you want to cut off the blood flow and you want to crank that tourniquet down so that you don't bleed out because that's really one of the most common ways people die is they get a cut or something like that or they get their legs shot and if they're bleeding out then it doesn't matter how many medicines or bandages you have that's definitely a, a, a thing that you want to understand how to do is how to stop the blood flow um, so that you can then patch them up later on they sell today some amazing tourniquets that are like almost instant tourniquets that apply massive pressure to any bleeding area, any leg or arm that needs to be, you know, shut off when it comes to the blood flow. So um, they're the ones I get, I found the cheapest ones, uh, most affordable are ones from LA police gear, LA, LA police gear.com is in Los Angeles, LA police gear.com. They have a number of tourniquets that you can get very effective tourniquets. Amazing. Some of the technology for tourniquets today blows me away. And a lot of these kits come with quick clot. They come with the cell locks, the, 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 um, the blood coagulate uh, that stops instantly the blood. So once you get that tourniquet on, you can put on that, that quick clot uh, bandage and it stops the blood flow pretty, pretty fast with the tourniquet. So, um, yeah, check that stuff out. It's it's good to have. We have about a half a dozen of those things around the homestead, different places. Because you know, if I'm up, if I'm operating a chainsaw or something like that, and a mistake happens, and I need to get to one quickly, there's they're they're everywhere. And so, and me, me and my wife both know how to use them. Awesome. All right. Uh, the next topic we want to talk about is wealth preservation. So, if you could expound on on how people are going to preserve their wealth during times of societal collapse. Today, everyone's about 401ks. If you want to preserve um, preserve your uh, your wealth today, it's like, yeah, you get investments. you got to buy gold and silver. I think gold and silver plays an important part, um, but there's lots of ways to do this. But I think if you really want to preserve your wealth during an economic collapse is to invest it in yourself, invest it in your education, invest it in learning some of these things, like I mentioned, like going to some of these seminars, maybe something like what Patriot Nurse does or other, or other providers do. Um, learn some knowledge invest in yourself, invest in your farm, invest in your land that you're going to buy, you know, having a, a number of pastures with, with fence, good fencing set up and, and some animals and, and some food, you know, that you have set aside and some, and some training on firearms and training on medical, this sort of thing. This is how you preserve your wealth. This is how you, you go back and you look at things like Abraham and it says he, he became very wealthy. Well, it's because he had livestock. He knew how to handle those livestock. You read about Jacob and how he handled his livestock. He also was very wealthy. He had flocks and herds. And it's because he, I mean, he, you saw how he worked out that out with Laban, where he produced his herds and on a massive scale. Well, he had knowledge. I would, you know, people ask me, who would you sit down and talk to in the Bible? Who, if you could, who would you sit down? It was Jacob. Jacob had so much knowledge. He was amazing at his knowledge and how he grew his herds. He knew so many things that are lost today when it comes to animal husbandry and so many, so many other things as well. So I'm like, man, if you can invest that time and learn as much as you can in yourself so that if something like this happened, you would fare so much better. Because not only that, not only is this education going to educate you on what to do, it's going to give you confidence. One of the biggest things that you're going to need to get through this time is confidence that you can get through it. It's a mind game. So a lot of people, when they see these insurmountable odds before them and all of the hardships that, that they're going to have to endure, it's sometimes human nature to just give up, roll over and die. Well, don't do that. If you have the confidence because you've invested time and money in yourself, being that wealth preservation, 
You're going to have what it takes to get through these things. So when it comes to wealth preservation, what was wealth back in the day? Not today, back in then. It was livestock. It was food production. It was land ownership. It was things that you could, it was material things that you can use to get your family to survive and to feed your family and get them through hard times. That, that, that's wealth. That's real, true wealth. Not the things that we see today, big screen TVs, fancy cars, and a 401k, and you know, being able to live out the rest of your days in a retirement home where they bring you margaritas all the time. That's not wealth. All right. So another thing that we're going to probably wrap this up with topic wise is debt freedom. And somebody who's got like big school loans and they got a bunch of debt and all of a sudden society collapses. What happens? Yeah. So uh, we'll talk about school loans, but we'll talk about debt. So one of the best things I did when I moved off grid, um, I moved off grid. And one of the first things I did is I consulted a lawyer and I declared bankruptcy. Okay. I didn't have very much to my name. I left the city with not a whole lot. I had some cash savings saved up and I declared bankruptcy. And I was basically homeless living on someone else's land at the time. And I was with my in-laws and they were going to use some of their savings to buy some land. So basically I had not anything. I didn't really have any major possessions. I had a couple, I had, I had two vehicles that were a number of years old, probably a decade old or more. And so they weren't worth anything, but that's what I had. And I, the bankruptcy court, he, oh, the guy, the lawyer, when I went to see the lawyer, he looked at everything I owned, which wasn't much. And he says, you're what, you are what we call, um, was it verdict proof or he said, basically I was a sure thing. You know, you're, you're a sure thing. You're, you're, you're going to be easy sailing through bankruptcy court. No problem. And once it was over, I owed nothing. I had, we had a bunch of our debt and it was all gone. It was different, stupid things that mostly we've been paying on for years and years and years, but because of the interest rates of our economic system and our debt system, they keep you enslaved to it so that you're paying well beyond what you owe. Oh, what did he call it? Judge oh, he said judgment proof because he looked at how long I've been paying on my debt and he realizes, the court also realizes that the interest rates that the, that the lenders give you are meant to keep you in debt forever you're going to pay way more than you ever borrowed. So it's not, some people are like, well, you can't declare bankruptcy. That's like stealing. Well, not really when you figure that the lenders are ripping you off because they're making you pay back way more than you ever borrowed in the first place. The judge, the court system also realizes that. And so most of the time, if you don't, if you have very few possessions or if you're willing to give up whatever possessions you have, you can be debt free. So here's what I tell people. Use the system to get out of the system and then never go back, never go back, use the system. It's there right now. And you have the luxury right now, that system of using it to get out of it, use it to get out of it. Because the reality is if an economic collapse happens and let's just say some order is maintained, um, they may use whatever debt they hold over you to control you and, and, and how you live and, it's just, it's going to be this thing over you the rest of your life. Get out of it get any way you can. Now, student loans or something else. <clears throat> we'll get to that in a second. But if you can use the bankruptcy system today to get out of it, let's just say, for instance, you have a new car, you have a new house, and you're, you're in debt up to your eyeballs, and there's no way you're ever going to be able to do this because you have too much debt. Give up everything you own because the court's going to look. If you, if you have material possessions that they can take hold of and confiscate and then sell to pay off your debtors, they will. Let them do it. Let them take everything you own because if you have the confidence, if you have the go gettingness to start over, you're going to be okay. Okay. You, you can, you can start over and be okay by giving up everything you own and letting them get, get out of the debt they have. Let the court rule that you're now debt free and you'll be set. You can go out and start new somewhere in a rural location where the cost of living is lower and you can start over and it, it'll be hard. You'll have to eat beans and rice for a while, but you'll be starting fresh with no debt and you're going to be, you're going to be way better off in like five years than you've ever been before in your life. And you're going to have more opportunities coming at you than you've ever had coming at you before in your life. So use the system to get out of the system where this falls short is now student loans. Student loans legally in this country cannot be dismissed by a bankruptcy court. Okay. And the students, the students, uh, the loan programs know this. The colleges know this. So they have spent decades trying to send the message to suburban America and, and just America in general 
that your kids can't make it unless you go to college. You have to go to college. So they've sold that message and they made everyone believe it. You're not going to make it in this world. They, they, they have the kids believing it. They have the parents believing it. And the parents are shamed. If you don't send your kids to college, you're bad parents. So the reality is everyone's going to college. The education system and the lenders know this. So they say, hey, if everyone believes they have to do it, we can charge whatever we want. And they also control, they have big influence in the government. So that's the one thing you can't get rid of. We're going we're gonna to charge whatever we want for education, and we're going to lobby the government so that they can never dismiss that debt. And we're going to be collecting money from now until the cows come home. And at a, at a really high interest rate, they're going to pay about two or three times more than they actually you know, use, depending on the interest and the time frame it pay, takes to pay back, maybe even twice or three times as much as you paid to go to school in the first place. So when it comes to student debt, you're kind of up a creek without a paddle. That's just re the reality of it. At some point, because this is coming to a head, the government officials know about it. The conservative and liberal political commentators know it, that this is, this is unsustainable. Debt forgiveness for student loans is coming. It has to come because this country is, is – is, or a collapse will take care of that problem for you anyway. <coughs> but – it's going to come. So, you know, Barack Obama talked about it. Uh, Bernie Sanders absolutely talked about it. Hillary Clinton talked about it. But the reality is even the Republicans know that it has to happen eventually if we're going to get these kids to be productive members of society because um, I'm under student loan debt. It's the one debt that I still have. I'm still paying on it. I'll probably be paying on it until I'm 60, um, you know, if, if the economy lasts that long. So it's just – it's an unsustainable method. But hey, here's the deal. Everything else – Get out of as much debt as you possibly can. And if that means declaring bankruptcy, use the system to get out of the system. You'll be so much better off down the road. It, and, and you can put your student loans in forbearance. And um, if you have to for a certain amount of time till you get recovered, but get out of debt, get out of debt. All right. Well, uh, I think that's all of the, the topics we were going to cover today. Is there anything else that you'd want to leave people with in regards to getting prepared other than get out of the city? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, other than get out of debt and get out of the city, I mean, that that's your biggest prep right there. You know, I, I've told people before because we've written a lot of articles on it. If you – a lot of people are into preparedness. A lot of people are into surviving the collapse because most people – understand when they look out and they see the fundamentals that we talked about at the beginning of the show, they realize where this is heading. It's not good. Okay. So they can see, they have some intelligence to see that. If you start preparing and you start prepare, getting into preparedness, the ultimate preparedness where this is logically going to end you up is on a homestead, somewhere on a homestead, somewhere in rural America where you can have the sustainable life that you want, where you can grow your own food, where you can have some livestock and, and, you know, have some land that you can maybe pass down to your children. Um, that's real, real wealth preservation. Going back to that for a second, because when I work so hard in my life to build what I'm building here in this homestead and my father-in-law, who's also here with us, was working so hard in his life to build what he has here on this homestead, passing that down, is true wealth preservation to your children because they're going to pick up where dad and grandpa left off and they're going to continue building on that and they're going to have something to pass down to their children. You can fit a lot of people on our 56 acres we have here, a lot of families down the road. But that's what real wealth preservation was in biblical times. The forefathers created what they created and they passed it down to their children and they passed it down to their children and it continued. You know, instead of ending up at uh, some sort of hospice center or reverse mortgage where you end up with nothing, you know, at the end of your life, work on something, get out of debt, get out into rural America somewhere, build for yourself some land up and have something you can pass down, down to your children. So that if the Messiah does delay and is coming, you have a future for your family, your long extended family, you're giving them something. So that was, that's what I would recommend you do is is concentrate on building something for your legacy, building something for your family's legacy that you can pass down from generation to generation. That's true wealth preservation. That's the way it needs to be. And that's true preparedness. If you push preparedness to its logical conclusion, you will end up homesteading. 
Excellent. Well, thank you, Zach, for coming on and, and discussing with us about preparing for any of these situations that might come up and all the different aspects of what people need to be looking at. I know there's a lot of fear mongering that goes on with end times or World War Three or societal collapse. And they just tell you, hey, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But there is hope whenever you actually provide a solution and you give people the steps that they can take to better prepare themselves for the situations that are possibly going to arise in the near future. And we know eventually something's going to happen where you're going to have to use at least some of these uh, concepts. Yeah, you said it really, really clear there. You have hope because, you know, our hope is in Messiah. Our faith is in God to protect his people. But at the same time, you have to get off your buff, your duff and do something. OK, and that, that's that brings hope when you go out there and you're working and you and you and, and you have you keep your faith strong. That's your true hope. But you got to get out and do something. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Now You See TV. I've been your host, Jake Grant. Please like, share and subscribe this video. If it's helped you out, get a little bit more prepared for societal collapse, preparing come what may. Thank you, Zach, for joining us. And until next time, everybody, shalom. Take care. Goodbye.